Okay. So I just want to um, welcome Phil Goddard to the Unschool po Podcast. Phil, thank you so much for um, tuning in from beautiful Bali. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I really enjoyed about our conversation up to now is that you're actually jealous of the cold weather. I, gosh, I, I am so jealous. I would love, what did you say? 13 degrees. 13 degrees this morning in London. 13 degrees C. I would love a bit of 13 on my face right now. Gosh, that would be gorgeous. It's, it's relentlessly 30 here. As I said, barley, two seasons, hot and hot and wet. And that's about it. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So there's like something in the British DNA, which just yearns for dri drizzle and cold. It's, Amazing. The drizzle I'm never really a fan of, but yeah, I do, you know, I, there is that human tendency as well, isn't it? That we, the grass is always greener, even literally. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so I've been in Bali. I intended to be here maximum of six months, but because of the, there's a state, state of emergency here and everything else going on. So it's not impossible, but nearly impossible to leave. It's easier to stay. So, mm -hmm. um, so what is it? Eight months coming up to eight months. Mm. that i've been here and i miss that cool freshness of air that you get yeah. on your face in the mornings you yeah. know that's just gosh yeah beautiful so would you mind just kind of introducing yourself anyone who, who's not familiar with you and your coaching yeah in work? um in the co okay just very very generically i started coaching people started paying me to coach them so i could say <laughs> i have said i started coaching professionally but well, i don't want anybody to help me up on the sales description act under that but let's just say people started paying me for coaching 2005 but i was doing it part-time it became my soul and soul vocation in 2011 business didn't really get going until sort of a couple of years after that hmm. um yeah, and it is. That's that's all I do um, is one-on-one -on -one coaching and writing and really active on social media, um, mainly around relationships and leadership. Um, and yeah, coaching perhaps people that are successful in business or career or work aspect of their lives, but perhaps not so successful in other areas. Mm. um perhaps in their health or indeed in their relationships mm. and yeah came to bali um yeah end of october 20th of october last year it'd been on the cards for about a year and just sold everything gave up everything and um yeah i'd never wow. even visited before but here i am <laughs> wow and so i mean from, from from my perspective i was just telling you earlier that i kind of Dis discovered you uh, as it were and then really got into the way you do live video on Facebook it's strange isn't it what was you know sometimes people resonate with you and um, I started making live video on Facebook once I'd watched you do it because uh, you're one of those very rare people as far as I'm concerned who are able to just be present and make the people watching feel very um, what's the word feel welcomed that's the word and uh that's that's really quite rare so whenever you whenever you're live phil from the beautiful bali i'm tuning in and i'm just i'm just enjoying the experience with you i'm just enjoying yeah, the, the presence you. um so really this is uh, you know you, you did a post the other day on facebook and that's really what prompted me to contact you because mm. um as i've just explained to you i've been on this health journey myself and um i had a diabetes diagnosis around about october time as well and i've been dieting and losing weight to try and reverse the diabetes and that's got me into um what i call the diet trap which maybe we can talk a little bit about <clears throat> and i'm also starting with a friend um a facebook group called food for thought which is about which is really asking the question what is the connection between mindset and diet you know how much is the mental game how much is the food game um so where should we start with all of that how are we going to unpack that well you know i can give a little bit of background as well so you know i'm 51 years old i struggled with weight for um pretty much all of my adult life in my head at least and that's an important point yeah um because i look back at pictures of me when i was uh <laughs> in my late teens and early 20s and i had thought to myself 
and until recently, like that post, so apparently the, the, the scales here, although they are Indonesian scales, so they might be lying a little, <laughs> but they do tell me that I'm, I'm, you know, pretty much back down to the weight I was in my early 20s. Um, mm. But I, you know, I had the thought a while ago, before, I mean, I lost, what, 10 kilos since I've been in Bali without even trying. Um, we can come back to that. But, you know, mm. before then, I would look and think, gosh, I wish I was as fat as that guy thought he was. No, or rather, I wish I was as fat as that guy who, you know, or let me put it another way. I wish I was as fat back when I thought I was fat, which was back then, um, because he was fine. Like, there was, he, he looked fine, quite dishy, in fact, quite a dishy guy. And um, hair, too. But... I, I believed I was fat. And it's funny, isn't it? There's that theory that we can we can certainly live into that. But I think the key point is because of that belief, because of how I saw myself, I mentally struggled with weight and um, was using food and indeed, you know, after a while, alcohol as well in what certainly in unhelpful ways unhealthy too but certainly in unhelpful ways so um yeah i guess there's stuff in there that that we could unpack where would you like to go well okay so the thing that kind of i'm picking up on is this idea of emotional eating so one of the people that, that is a friend of mine created a program about emotional eating and um she kind of cured herself of it in in a way she's now no longer an emotional eater and she's released a whole load of weight. And for her, it was about learning to um, kind of pick up on that feeling and allow that feeling or that thought or whichever way around you want to express it to just release. So I don't know whether that resonates with you or whether you feel that that's Yeah, what... and, and to be honest with you, I, I'm a great fan of simplicity as well. So um, it's it's... I, I, I feel actually, and uh, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could try this out, that we could wipe out all um, weight issues and obesity and what have you in a single generation if we stopped teaching children to use food to help them to feel better. So that would mean stop using food as any kind of reward, any kind of comfort, and just to get back in touch with what food is here for which is of course to <laughs> to nourish us and nice. really focus on that because our you know the design of the body is so perfect when we take all of our head <clears throat> thinking out of the equation our body's always talking to us we know when we're when we're honest we know what feels good to eat even our body will will crave stuff right we'll crave because our body's telling us hey you you know, you need more iron and that's why you've got a craving for broccoli. I haven't met too many people with that going on. Um, <laughs> but, you know, our Either. bodies talk to us. Our bodies talk to us like they talk back to us as well. Like, you know, oh, my God, it feels horrible now. I've, you know, like, yes, I did enjoy the fish and chips or whatever, but don't feel so great now. I'm all bloated and heavy and what have you. And, like, mm. um, a typical breakfast I'll have here is um, – poached duck egg and i think <laughs> funnily enough i think the eggs themselves are actually poached as in they are acquired by poaching anyway so they are they are they are poached squared in that respect so poached yes. duck eggs on um, a bed of greens such as spinach and what have you and like my body sings in receipt of that kind of breakfast it's like oh my god and compared with like some heavier stuff that i might have can't think of anything off the top of my top of my head but like listening to our bodies it tells us so i think coming back to that point we could wipe out obesity if we stopped using food to change how we feel mentally now now there is a you know the body is a, a system so yes we can take on board food and chemicals and what have you that do change our state of mind and there's something behind do we even need to do that right so and I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that, but, um, yeah, just for, um, this is why I think it's, it's, it can be so difficult. You talk about a diet trap. Well, I think it's more really a, a food trap because 
if our relationship with food includes, um, you know, like a guilty lover. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. We'll keep, we'll keep having that uh, illicit affair with them. That's a great way of putting it. Feels so good. I know I've just thought of that. It's, it's because it feels so good. And then when we're without them, we miss them. And you so crave even them, yes. you know, crave them. So dieting deprivation is what doesn't work, right? It's not really the dieting. It's, it's the feeling. It's the belief that we are depriving ourselves. That's really hard work to work against that, to feel deprived because you know, what? if you could come up with, if you could come up with different, different foods that you still loved and they're all healthy and it was made really easy for you, you wouldn't feel deprived. It would take that out of the equation. So um, I guess there's a lot in there, but really, gosh, what had changed for me um, over the last, probably the last few years is to, is to change my relationship with not as I alluded to in the post, it could look like I changed my relationship with food, but the, the, the change in my relationship with food has been a byproduct of changing my relationship with my thinking about food. So, um, the thought that saying, come on, you really want to have that illicit affair with that lover, i.e. that the jam donut or whatever, Mm. Um, dark chocolate digestives my thing gosh mm. um, you are supposed to eat the whole packet right you buy it it's yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. Yeah, yeah yeah that kind of thing it's like to change change your relationship with with that thinking of course that sounds so much easier than it actually is apart from what goes on is we we actually make it difficult but yeah that's for rob that's for me is what's changed <laughs> well there's a couple of things come to mind um do you think that being in Bali has made a difference because maybe you're just not exposed to what I'd call the food culture that we live in, in, you know, advanced industrial societies? There's a real health food culture here, but there's an abundance of food. Alcohol is freely available. And so is, so is, you know, the fried chicken. There's, you know, there's okay. plenty of fried chicken places. You can, <coughs> okay. eat, you can eat as unhealthy as you, as you want. But my, my journey with food had changed anyway. So we mentioned keto um, hmm. before we started recording. And so I had changed my diet in 2017. So for, for the sort of the two years before I came to Bali, um, lost quite a bit of weight, but I wasn't, I didn't feel deprived on that. And there was a, there was periods where I would be really strict in just eating that particular diet and it's funny how we use the term diet to describe something other than um you know the types of food we're eating it's Mm. like oh i'm on a diet well we're always on a diet right yes it it doesn't really make sense to me and when you when you i think the truth is when people say i'm on a diet what they really mean is i'm depriving myself at the minute that's generally what people mean let's get yeah. let's be really honest about yeah. it. That, yeah. that's what's really going on and i have a list of banned i have a list of banned foods that i can't yeah get. so then you can see why it doesn't work when you use the term the diet trap point but then when you start using that, being a little bit more honest so i'm on a diet sometimes my diet's healthy sometimes not so much um but for the two years before i came to bali yeah i would keto became my default so, you know, just cutting out most carbohydrates. And I, I would go periods of time, you know, two, three weeks and really have hardly any carb, carbs at all. And then other, other uh, I might have a few days where like, yeah, I'll go out and have fish and chips with my sister, which is about as carb loaded as you can get. Mm. Um, but that was fine. Because like I say, the relationship with all of that stuff had changed so for the preceding i don't know 28 27 years maybe certainly at least 20 years there was always this thought that i i need to lose weight i need to be different i need to be a different shape i need to be healthier Mm. and i have to give up i have to give up what it is that helps me feel good (laughs) and uh there's there's like the key to it all actually rob 
that that belief oh i have to give up what it is that helps me feel good and it's a yeah it can look really true and then you know maybe chemically there's of course there's stuff going on there but mm. it's not so much it's it's not so true <laughs> as um as it might look so therefore if you unhook the the thing that makes me feel good from that it loses its power yeah yeah you can drive it <laughs> I feel I'm going a bit all over the place here, Rob, but um, I, 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 I feel that, um, so, you know, to be really honest with you, there's times when I simply wanted to lose weight. So I was doing keto to lose weight. Yeah. But having said that, I've would, I found it ridiculously easy. Mm. Um, not a struggle at all because I was making a very conscious choice. Oh, that means, that means I'm not going to re be eating this. I'm not going to be, I mean, I love a glass of decent red wine. Oh my goodness. So you should drink a lot of beer, um, craft beers and stuff like that. Enjoy mm. beers. Um, but like, um, I refer to my sister. That's because that's kind of my last memory of the UK. I stayed with my sister for a few weeks just before I came to Bali when I, I gave up my apartment and stuff. Mm. And that's, so I was doing a bit of, you know, keto became my default then but there were evenings where she would like don't you want to have a glass of wine i'm like no, no actually i don't i didn't even want it so there was no there i wasn't depriving myself it was it became a simple choice hmm. and that's easier to make that choice when you have unhooked the feel good from what you eat or yeah. drink so yeah, it probably yeah. is worth diving just a little bit more into that because yes, like I, as I said at the beginning, we're taught that right from a really early age. Oh, you've been mm. good today. So we're going to take you out for a nice meal or, yeah. you know, I'm sorry you're upset. Here's the Snickers or whatever. It's well, like here's your pocket money. I'm going to go and spend it on, you know, crisps and sweets. Whatever. And... Yeah. Yeah. So like we are, we are taught right from a really young age that food i'm not saying it doesn't help us feel better like i i love food like it's just part of one of the joys of being a human being so awesome. i love different kinds of food and when i get with my you know i've got three other siblings and my mum we we laugh because yeah our, our, i'm sure this is like this in a lot of families that we end up talking about food like by default you know you kind yeah. of talk about food a lot it's one of the joys of life but it doesn't have to be used to help you feel good about other things in life. Like food can be there to enjoy because it's food and I've got a nice glass of wine or whatever your tipple is. But um, when you're taught right from a young age that, Oh, if you're feeling a bit down, have something to eat. If you're feeling a bit down because Ipswich town have lost again, <laughs> your favorite football team have lost. I think that's why I became overweight because I was just telling them. They kept losing. Um, <laughs> so um, it's like there's, there's, it doesn't sound particularly sensible, is it? Like, oh, yeah, your football team have lost, your sports team have lost, so eat something. Put it like that. It's kind of, you can see that's a bit odd, but hang on. That's what we're taught. We're taught to, you know, oh, if you feel on a bit of a downer, have something to eat. But of course, long term, it's you're not really it doesn't help you feel better it's kind of like borrowing from the future actually it's like oh if I, wow. certainly I, I i saw alcohol in this way of if i used um alcohol to feel better i was always borrowing from the next day borrowing from the future how do what, what do you mean by that can you just unpick that a little bit um all right so this is part of a uh, uh, although I have noticed going through, you know, prolonged periods of time now of not having any alcohol, um, even just one drink, I would notice. But if you're a regular drinker, and by that I just mean, okay, you'll have maybe even just three or four drinks during the course of the week. You might not notice much of a difference by just having one. But if you have three or four, then you probably will feel that the next day. So you're borrowing. So it will feel, it will feel good. You get the buzz and whatever from having that. 
but you're paying for it the next day. Got and, it. You know, I've certainly had periods of time in my life where I'd have even more than that. You know, you used to go out and get absolutely hammered. And yeah. like the weekend might be a write off. Yes. And of course, that just doesn't make sense anymore because I no longer want to be borrowing because there's actually quite a high interest charge on all of that as well, of course. So um, that just doesn't, doesn't make sense anymore. And it's. Um, <laughs> Just gonna, we're going to keep coming back to it and maybe we'll dive into it a little bit more. Like, What's the alternative than seeking relief from how you feel? But just, just, just to stay a little bit on track, I think even just noticing that and getting honest with myself and anybody listening to this, I invite them just to take a look at that. Am I, am I, <laughs> I was going to say opening the fridge. I, I, I don't know about you, but I open the fridge to look for answers to life. I, I can't be the only one. 100%. Um, yeah, it's all in yeah. there. But uh, yeah, in his Wikipedia, yeah. <laughs> Fridgepedia. But um, I think I did it earlier today. Just like open the fridge, nothing actually. There's nothing in my fridge. Um, where was I? <laughs> where was I? <laughs> yeah, it's just I just invite people to notice. Are you having whatever it is, the food or the drink, for the enjoyment of it, or to change how you feel? Mm. That's a really great question. And to be honest, Phil, one of the things that's just come up again from listening to you is I've never really thought very much about my, how food was presented to me and my family and how, I was, how it was introduced. So I come from a Jewish family and food is, you know, it, it's, is it God, is it food? You know, which is the more important? Food is a, food is a value. Um, and also eating more than you want was a value. Like having seconds... That, you know it's not it's not love it's just food that kind of thing but that really does go on and it it becomes kind of reinforced in your mind almost without you realizing so much conditioning around it isn't there you know you must clear your plate you know, I, know. I i was of the generation that got reminded of the the starving children in africa it's an awful phrase isn't it but yeah it's like you know clear your plate was this children starving in africa it's never really made that much sense to me but yeah we we're taught to eat what we're not taught, so here we are, we're, 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 we're taught to use food and perhaps later in life drink um, to change how we feel rather than for the sheer just enjoyment and nourishment mm -hmm. of it. Um, that's weird, it's gone for me. I'm sure it's going to be really profound what I was going to say. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Well, I can ask you another question. Yeah, then you sorry, yes. Yeah. No, no, I just, I just come back to me. There you go. It happens like that. I'd give up. I'd give up on telling you and it's come back. Yeah. And we're also, it's like, what were we not taught? And that is to actually just listen to our bodies. I mean, that whole bull crap about clearing your plate, irrespective of how your body feels. That's, that's like, hang on a second. Is it? I'm sorry, I'm going to be really direct. If, you know, if you're a parent and you're saying that to your, to your child, you're telling your child to ignore what, it, what that child's body is telling them, like the yeah. God-given wisdom or whatever, whatever you believe, but like the wisdom within that child's body, which will say, you know, I've had enough now, thanks. And, and just like suggesting, well, you need to clear your play and whatever. It's like you're attempting to override that and teaching, teaching a child to ignore wow, what magnificent intelligence and wisdom our bodies have. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that the, the rationale behind it is, let's say, for example, if you're a parent and you've made food for your children, you put love into that food because you're, you know, you're nourishing your family, you can see them not finishing it as some sort of a rejection. That's the only, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to justify it, I'm just trying to explain it to myself. It's obviously not... Yeah um right quick question so one of the things that i found when i talk to um women about this because I, and i want to try and get male perspectives to see if there is a difference or not so one of the one of the things that has come up in my conversations is that in some ways dieting is used as a well I'm just going to use the language that I've kind of come across as, as a tool of oppression against women to make them think constantly about the, their appearance and being accepted by men. Mm. It, what would you say, if anything, are the differences between the way men and women think about food and dieting? 
Well, I, I think anyway, there's just, I don't know about food and dieting, but just that whole appearance thing. Um, there's a lot more conditioning. There's a lot more noise out there for women to get distracted by about their appearance and their eyes. Perhaps not, you know, but that is changing. Gosh. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going to acknowledge that. It, it, we're, <laughs> it, that's how it looks to me that um, girls, girls are girls are taught their appearance has has an importance that boys are not subjected to yes that's just that's just how it looks to me i don't ever remember like being told really my parents really mattered that much um until in my teens and got interested in a bit more interested in girls but yeah it's it's like we make that such a thing with with children as well um and so I, so I think it becomes very easy to understand if we, if we just take those three components. One, we're taught to use food to change how we feel. Mm -hmm. Two, we're taught to ignore what our body is telling us. Mm. And, and three, we are also taught that we need to look a certain way. Now, all of that, pun intended, looks like a recipe for disaster and for suffering, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we've kind of discovered the three horsemen of the apocalypse so far. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So part of the work that I, I have done in my teaching career is to work with um, young people with eating disorders. So I, I saw the, the raw end of that really. Um, and then it kind of, it probably starts with the, with the sort of idea of appearance and dieting, but then it kind of morphs into something else. Um, and it, it can actually be a, a method of controlling when you feel out of control. So if you're in a stressful situation, sometimes you'll, you'll use restriction um, or over-exercising in order to kind of exert some control over your life where you don't feel any. But I think that's out of our remit, really. Yeah, and, I, and, and you're kind of touching on like the deeper aspect of, of, of um, that whole misunderstanding that we need to change how we feel i you know when i talk to to clients they've never even, most people have never even given that consideration that you know when you're sad or depressed or mm. anxious or stressed that um you don't actually need to try and change that like to most people that doesn't make sense hang on i'm anxious i'm stressed i'm sad I, of course i want to feel different to what the hell are you talking about yes you know, so I should do everything I possibly can within my control to change how I feel. And I got taught from a young age the best way or the default way of doing that is, yeah, is to is to eat or whatever. You. Mm. So there's like it looks like it's so deeply ingrained in us. But you know, there's I think the whole thing about use, using food to feel better that's a misunderstanding, but I think that's a greater misunderstanding to believe that we need to do something about how we feel. Yeah. Rather than just accept it. Um, that is a very difficult message to get across, isn't it? To people. Yes. Yeah. And it can take, you know, some people, one conversation, they see something new. Um, <laughs> others, <laughs> six months even a year and really like I, I, I it, well it, it just really depends it because it's so deeply ingrained it's so deeply ingrained in us rob it's it and in a way it doesn't look like it makes sense and i, I I've, I've had clients that have, have got it and then come back a couple of years later and we'll talk about something else and then they're like oh yeah okay so now i really get it i really do see yeah. so maybe there's different levels to that understanding hence different levels to the misunderstanding also that it right. plays out but um and i'm open to see i'm open to seeing it the, the the uh the extent if you like of the story you tell ourselves about <sighs> look here's the thing if we really if we really got that we never had to do anything about how we feel and and remember that like never ever forgot it because certainly i forget for sure mm. if i didn't then i wouldn't be arguing with people on facebook <laughs> <laughs> you know i just wouldn't get involved in so much stuff 
you know, yeah, there's a, yeah. there's like, I, I have a little, I, I say little, I have a bit of an insight recently where, um, I don't need to go into detail, just like, I just, I suddenly remembered something like a deeper knowing and it just, it just helped me see, oh my gosh, I'm involved. I've been involved in so much stuff that's so irrelevant. That's so, so unnecessary, mm. you know? And, um, it was huge to see that hooage if you're from Suffolk, it was huge to see that. And, um, I think that really the same applies. Like the, there are times when I realize, yeah, like heartbreaks, the one, you know, anybody's experienced heartbreak, there's, you know, you can feel, well, I know I'm going to, this is going to pass. I don't need to do anything with this. I would really like to, but I really get it. I don't need to. Mm. And the, whatever we term the craving for food, by the way, it feels like I'm jumping, but I don't know that, but we can look at the craving for food, but the craving for the food comes from the misunderstanding that we need to feel a certain way. It's like, I've been taught to use food to change how I feel. So I, I crave food because of that misunderstanding. We don't need to try and change the craving only really look deeper at changing the misunderstanding so what i love about this conversation is that what what you're helping me do or helping people who are watching do is to understand that in a way from a point of view of a coach diet food weight loss is an amazing metaphor for everything else that might be difficult for us because it it does come Mm -hmm. down to thinking it does come down to our thoughts and how we relate to them yeah. Wow. So that, that feels like possibly a nice place to end our, our conversation. Ooh, um, yeah. So Phil, I just want to thank you again. I mean, it was uh, really, really enlightening for me and just lovely to spend time with you as I, as you. I, thank as you. I thought it would thank be. You. <laughs> thank you. It feels like we sort of scratched the surface a little bit and I'm happy to go deeper with, with anyone or in, in, indeed with you, but um, yeah. Yeah. If, um thoroughly enjoyed it thank you lovely thank you so much phil